language starts to fall apart as we start to try even to talk about this or discuss it because we know what we're talking about and most we both, of the time in the sense of yeah. that space yeah okay but then try and describe that to someone or tell them where that is or tell them how to get there that becomes that's when it becomes very difficult to try and put this into language or into logos and i think you know creatively that's what's always driven me is, is finding the ways to get back to there as, as much as i can to try and find that i don't know i use the word authentic that comes from a somewhere All right. and how we catch it and you know, and i guess maybe you've had this experience when you try to get there you just fuck up it doesn't work <laughs> it never fucking happens yeah, yeah 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 and then when you let go all of a sudden it falls out of the sky it does yeah yeah well this was part of how we met and how we got into this whole thing yeah, yeah, yeah. around the drum it's I mean, I often say for me, this again, when I'm talking about touching the void, touching this greatness, this bigness, this thing that's outside of words yeah, that yeah. we can't talk about. I mean, how I initially touched that was I found it inside the drum. And people often say to me, well, that sounds strange. And what it is, it's not... <clears throat> I had a, I I had an experience working with a shamanic drum. All right, okay, and it wasn't about creating music. It's not about creating rhythm. It wasn't about creating a something. All right, it wasn't about creating. It was about something I discovered in there. All right, I discovered something actually in there, and what I actually found that was very very interesting that was over a period of time which leads us to why we were yeah, here tonight yeah. is as I was using that I, I often describe it as like one of like like a, a tool or like a, a like a drug or like a, a or a shamanic tool to go into an altered state of mm -hmm. consciousness or an expanded awareness I suddenly realized that other people could tap into the same thing could tap into the same thing it wasn't that we would be sharing in the experience of music we'd be sharing in a direct experience of something that was mystical and that's what started to fascinate me yeah about but the there's drum. like a common misconception mm. i don't know if it's actually like a misconception yeah but like take a look at the drum like it's a musical instrument sure yeah but in the sense of the shamanic experience we do not look at it as a musical instrument in some ways no 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 because you, you told me yourself that you're into the not the beat this while some it, shamans yeah. are true like, true 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 yeah, yeah they yeah. focus on the beat mm -hmm. but you focus on something else yeah like yeah the drone yeah. which the yeah drum that creates the, the resonance you got it it's <clears throat> there's a wholeness to the sound i often say it's like the drone that comes through okay it's like we have the beat of the drum the boom 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 yeah. boom in between the beats there's this drone okay or if you listen to the drum and really pay fucking attention this is why i say to people if, you, if you're <clears throat> interested in shamanic drumming you know anyone who's going to da 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 i'm pissing around with the beat brilliant that that that's musical extremely talented okay yeah. and then there's some amazingly gifted drummers out there i think <laughs> but the the shamanic drum we're looking for what's in between the beats all the time and it becomes really really interesting when people like yourself or a couple of the guys and girls that were here tonight when we participate in that you know within what we call uh, a sacred space within yeah. set and saying within a ceremony this mystical thing does happen and it becomes a happening and it becomes a shared experience within the room that tends to go beyond the musical it tends to go beyond the musical yeah. so people don't go away feeling entertained they go away going what the fucking hell just happened why did i see what i see um, you know, this is now, it gets a bit strange because people will have mystical experiences just sitting and being present to the drum. Yeah. You know, people have it's vision. a gateway. Yeah. It's a gateway drug. It's a gateway drug, yeah. Yeah. It is.
we move beyond language. Yeah. This is what goes on. This is the, if I was going to describe it succinctly and shortly, we move beyond language. If we move beyond language, we're really talking about moving beyond the thinking mind or what we perceive something is. Because when I say language, I'm not just saying the spoken word. Language also means everything that we create, you know, vision that we see, the constructs that we make. Okay, these are constructs of language. The essence of where I believe the shaman or the shamanic drum is coming from, it's coming from a place in time, if we were going to put it in a linear time. It's been around for a long time. So we're working with an essence that's beyond language beyond Logos. So we use the essence and we take a shamanic journey yeah. to a place. So we go to a place beyond language. If we go beyond language, we start to see reality for what it truly is, not what we think it is, not what we perceive it is, not what we remember it is. We come into the present moment. That can be really fucking shocking. It, it sounds very simplistic, but that actually can be really shocking. And then you, you find sometimes people will have the experience and they will literally go, oh, what was that? What the fuck happened then? I can't remember. And that, that's what's happening. Actually, we have to learn and work with ourselves to gently be able to open the yeah. practice, to be able to stay open to the true nature of reality. Another interesting byproduct to it is if we can get quiet now we can use the drum you know yoga yoga is amazing i practice yoga union all right becoming one with something mind and body becoming one uh, practicing union it doesn't really matter on the technique you know we're find, finding ways to get to that place that moves beyond language then the miraculous i always say happens or so, or we're getting to the edges, to the edges of the void. And we're, we're allowing for the miraculous to come into our lives. You know, our lives are so busy. You know, we're, we're, we're working all the time. Yeah. The, the union. Let's use the word union. Yeah. Yeah, union. All right. Which, interestingly, yoga, the word yoga means union. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of yoga is not so much about looking really good in the gym. It's about union of mind and body, or union between you and your environment, which really means being very present. Yeah. Which is and aware. Awareness. A state completely. of awareness. Yeah. You know, That's I mean, the thing. I, I, I love the simplistic practice of just, you know, I, just I get, breathe and move. Breathe and move and become aware of and all the, the senses yeah, yeah. and just becoming completely present and there. Um, and, 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 and again, th that was. That was but that's like an, it's like a, like an, what's the word? It's an opposite to, to what we're doing with the shamanic experience, isn't mm -hmm. it? Like, because in yoga, you have to breathe and you become aware. Yep. Mm -hmm. What we do with the shamanic drum. Yep. Is we go out. Yep. This is it. But we, with both, I think, I think it would be true enough to say that, um, both techniques end up in the same place. There's yeah. like two different routes are going there. So it's like, and I enjoy the practice going into the body completely absorbed within all the senses. If I make all of my senses awake and aware, it's like paying attention to the drum. If I listen to the drum, I look at the drum, I smell the drum, I can taste the air, I can feed it with every sense of my body. I'm completely present to this organism and to what sound is going on. The head shuts up. Yeah, the, the head will shut up, and I can find that within this union, and, and then I find it within the union of, with the drum. And the the only thing that I find that was really really interesting with the drum, and I think this is why, I, I mean, as a musical instrument, how long has that been with us? Five thousand, ten thousand, fifteen thousand years? I, I, I don't have know. No idea. No, you know, a man has been banging the drum for a long time, and yeah. this resonance, the, this sharing, can happen around the drum, which is, and that's why I love the thing of a drum circle. 
okay, um, because it's about everyone becoming present. And, and I, think that, I think we see remnants of this in our religions. You know, there is this thing, you know, uh, going to church once a week on a Sunday. Okay, when we go there for worship. Yeah. Okay, all right. And uh, I really think that that's, uh, I would often say, um, that maybe may have worked some years ago. All right. But I think it's human means we need to sometimes, you know, we're busy, we do a busy life. At least once a week, we need to try and find a way to reconnect back to the natural, back to the body back to the true nature of experience um, you know which is you could say symbolically that's what we do when people go to church or when they worship or when they're praying okay words fall short yeah a direct experience say laid in with the moon cycles once a week or once a month actually having a mystical experience becoming present literally resets your body resets you as a human being reconnects us to what is natural in our life brings us up to, it's like a like reboot in a computer yeah it's a bit like being able to achieve that and push the restart button it's like hitting that reset button and you do feel refreshed um is i think this is one of the most important things about the shamanic drum is it can allow this to happen or a direct experience of the mystical whether it's whether we use yoga or whether we're using any form of practice at all is to be able to achieve that direct experience and that interests me i think the drum interests a lot of other people because of the mystical experiences that can happen within this yes it's true people have visions people gain insights people see into the worlds of where we start to go into the magical and the mystical this is true I mean, if we if we look historically, and you go back through history, m the mystical experience as it's been achieved is normally has its root right back in a shamanic history. You find it in nearly every religion at its core, the mystical experience that drives it. And I personally believe that that actually is a God-given right to us as human beings, to be able to experience the divine in one way or another and as a byproduct i think you know if that expands consciousness or awareness you know that's kind of got to be a good thing because i think it comes with a sense of intelligence yeah. you know like we talked about food and nutrition uh, or yoga or some of the things that we kind of got into in the past one of the byproducts to that is you become more sensitive you become more awake, you become more aware. So your actions start to become more intelligent. Actually, I really like the term aware. Yeah, yeah. I really like the word aware. Because mm. it tells you, like, it tells that somebody is in control of yeah. themselves and their yeah. surroundings and mm -hmm. aware of, you know, everybody else. And That's it, How yeah. you're feeling, but how they're feeling. Yeah, it's yeah, a state yeah, of yeah, awareness. yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a, you know, it's a... Mm cool thing to 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 be aware of yeah basically it is yeah i mean i mean i think artists not all artists but artists we kind of get into understanding this a little bit because of the nature of what we're doing all the time all right or, or, or at least this was kind of was my experience you know so we start to touch the mystical or find ways but it is so true. It's like if I'm, I'm drumming. I'm not feeling what I'm feeling. I'm feeling what everyone else is doing. I feel the inside world, and I can feel the outside world. If that was just in a sense of making normal decisions in life, how the hell can I make a decision for someone else unless I can really feel what's going on for them? Yeah. You know, I think that has implications culturally. You know, in or the way, well, just the way we function in culture. I think the more opportunities to be awake we are, the more opportunities there are for intelligent decisions to be made. I think it's just a natural byproduct of becoming more human that has always been something that I actively seeked out, which is, and the best route I ever found in was the oldest of lineages, which, which was the root of shamanism. Yeah. 
um, and, and I'm which more, is like the out of the boundaries of of language, but it's yeah. not out of the boundaries of tradition. No, it's not. And if we there's look, there's a certain Mark, like it's, it's been done so long that there's a kind of truth to it, isn't mm -hmm. it? Like, I think it stands the test of time because it's n we're not playing with language. You know, right. So it's not like a religion that's written down like like a an instruction book, an instruction mm -hmm. manual. If I like within some yogas, we can find you have you stand like this, you breathe like that, you do like this. It, well, all those rules are thrown out of the window. All we're really doing is finding a way to move beyond language. That's been done for ten thousand, twenty thousand years. The basic principle of how this is done worked twenty thousand years ago. And it still works today. And so it connects us to something that is really, really primal, which I think is the body and it's the earth and this planet, okay? And the drum moving outside. If there's no language, there's no instruction. There is just this naturalness that we connect with. What was your like first gateway experience, like the first shamanic experience? Or oh. I mean, like, what, 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 what's the starting point? Because, like, you know, like most art, <laughs> not, not deep. even like, not even most artists, yeah. but like people in general, hmm. like, I think they're, I don't know, they see that there's like three or or five like major turning points in mm -hmm. every person's life. It's kind of like that. Sure, I think it's sure, five. Sure. Yeah, like, it, be it either like a broken relationship or. Yep accident mm -hmm. you know death whatever yeah, yeah just like a turning but and then i know that you had one mm -hmm. like in 92 was it yeah it was no yeah i think it was yeah in 92 yeah yeah and and i mean i loosely describe it as an, the near-death experience yeah, yeah. okay um and i use the i loosely describe it as that uh, if i look back into you know i always it was a strange child <laughs> rather strange child right. you know i spent a lot of time alone uh and i always had a pencil and a paper in my hand quite an isolated person very observant towards life i spent quite a bit of time in nature but fast forwarding yeah 1992 i mean the easiest way to sum that up I think by the time I'd hit 1992, I'd drunk enough alcohol to serve me for the rest of my life. And it wasn't the first time that I'd woke up in hospital being resuscitated, but this time I'd woken up in hospital. Uh, I'd been resuscitated again. I was told quite straightly that if you carry on living your life the way you do, you know, with the condition your body's in. I mean, I had a liver like a piece of old carpet by that time. Oh, my God. Yeah. How I, old were you? But I was, by that time, I was 29. All right. And 29 is an interesting age, all right, because 29 to 30 is a big catalyst time for yeah. people in their lives. It's I heard the same thing about 25, like there's a click. They're, they're, they're kind of, some people call it like Saturn returning, and yeah. it kicks in from like 25 to about 30. There, there's, there's a place in people's lives where they kind of start to go through a transition where they start to become the people they will for the next 20 years of their adult life. Yeah. Uh, but my experience was, you know, uh, at 29, I, you know, it's a near-death experience. And, and it's not, it was nothing like, you always hear people talking about seeing the white light at the end of the tunnel. And all. this is a fucking crock of fucking shit, that is. You know, I think a lot of that is fairy stories and things that are made up to entertain us. How I would describe it is like... I woke up, and I woke up in a hospital bed, but I didn't just wake up in a hospital bed, I woke up, and you know, I could see what a fucking asshole I was being, the way I was treating myself in my life, the way I was treating the people that were around me, the way I was living my life, and the way I was destro destroying myself. Um, it's like, I, I had an insight into who I was and what I was up to. Mm -hmm. and. And it was a really, really powerful and profound experience. When I say an insight, I saw I felt it in every part of my being, every part of my being. And 
it brought about enough inspiration and enough power within me to catalyze change. Now, to catalyze change through the near-death experience or how this was catalyzed, it's an interesting thing to describe. It's not like I woke up with inspiration and this, you know, I literally watched my external world start to change. I watched people that were around me fall away. I watched miracles start to happen in my life. And I really, really became aware that there is something that's unseen behind the scenes that's really shaping what we consider is the physical reality. And, and I had an experience of it. And it had profoundly changed my life. You know, I'd gone from one day being, uh, like I often say, a drunken asshole and a bit of an idiot, okay, to someone who flipped polarity completely, could see what I was and what I was doing. And and it was just a profound experience. Yeah, I, but this I, is, this is yeah. like, it's it's so common. Yeah. Like you, you see these types mm. of stories all the yeah, time. Yeah. Like, not even with artists, but in with people in general. Sure. I, I think so, you know, with some with, with some things. Like, like drinking alcohol, like I say. I often loosely describe it like this. It, you know, it was effective in my life, uh, for the way I was living my life at the time. It made me behave like an idiot one that was quite asleep at the yeah. time um but i did drink enough of it that it it worked in one way it blew my life to pieces and then i was left with a new life afterwards um, i was never left with the reason to ever drink it again i was like one thing that was interesting i think if you do if you say you do a drug like alcohol yeah. okay and you do enough of it okay it will work <laughs> it <laughs> eventually will, it will, will work. eventually work or it's gonna fucking kill you yeah it's a gamble yeah, yeah. it's gonna kill you it is a uh, russian roulette with, with substances. yeah it is it can be a russian roulette <laughs> okay. yeah I, th I, th I think it's as human beings we do have this strange desire within the western culture to intoxicate ourselves one way or the other you know, you know i've got a really good cup of coffee there. yeah me too yeah and most people wouldn't consider that a drug but, but it know, is it is yeah. yeah you know it's written into every work contract you know three yeah. four o'clock you stop for coffee yeah nothing you get done in the afternoon otherwise yeah yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but about the the so your near death experience was that like connected to the shamanic thing or was it not <clears throat> It was, but how it kind of worked out, it's like I had this experience, okay, so near-death experience, okay. New life opens up to me, okay, and within this new life, okay, I start to search and I start to seek and then I'm really trying to find out who what I were, am. What were you doing, like, uh, art-wise okay, at that time? Uh, yeah, uh, at that time. I was just, bra I'd broken into tattooing. Mm -hmm. I was working as a tattoo artist. Um, back in the UK at the time, okay. So I was working as a tattoo artist, so I'd thrown myself back into that. I mean, it, would, it was what really, really motivated me at that time. Um, I was fascinated by working with people and working with human contact. I mean, I mean that, that type of artistic expression where I was really working on that one-to-one -one basis with people and really helping them be able to go through their own journeys, pull out, the symbolic imagery that was yeah. important to them. So I worked as a tattoo artist. And the drum, interestingly, it came along in my one of my own spiritual journeys in seeking. I mean, I literally got out one day and just said, this is it, I'm getting on an airplane, I'm, I, I'm going to fucking America. And I did just get up that morning, I walked out of the studio, I locked the door, I didn't have a coat on, nothing. I walked out and I just got, literally on the bus and i went to heathrow airport i went into the airport and i bought a ticket in the airport and i flew to arizona all right didn't have a coat didn't have nothing on me <laughs> and i just arrived actually i actually read this on on wikipedia it's yeah it's there but without the details that you, you, ah, you okay yeah yeah, yeah you yeah. thought about it then you just did it the yeah next morning and it literally was that i mean i did say i did i i rang my mother up at the time and i just yeah. said look i'm off she said where the <laughs> you go in like oh my it's god what's, what's he up to and i took to my mother i said can you pop up and water the plants 
Uh, I said, the keys are around the back un- under the stone where they always are. She said, where are you going? I said, I- I- I'm going to going to America. She said, what? Where? <laughs> where? And she said, how long are you going to be? And I said, I really don't know. I, r- I really don't know. And it was. <laughs> and so, anyway, I there's little old me, you know, no coat on, bit cold, arrives in Arizona. I had no idea, you know why I was there I'm just kind of following a, an intuition and a little voice inside of me and and anyway an adventure starts when we know I start to connect with some other people that were like-minded like myself I journeyed and spent some time up on the reservations out there and I started to get in touch with the land and I and, and I met some interesting people that um, I wouldn't use the word uh, mentors I would say I met some interesting in indigenous people that had an attitude to life that fascinated me they seemed to be much more connected to the something that i was always trying to find or put back together in my life what kind of things well i was really what i really struggled with it was like i i I think i understand you but like yeah okay what what really got me it was like i had no idea how to really live and operate in this world as a creative person or as someone like me as an artist okay now when i say operate i mean uh, how was i to balance some of the visionary aspects of what i had the natural feelings i had about how we are all connected because as human beings and how the hell i could function in a normal society in a day-to-day life and a job and i was really fascinated by how, how how the hell I could integrate into society because I felt so weird so off so different so mm, that I didn't fit into this box and I found a lot of help from indigenous people that have I think over the years found ways to be open to life open to spirituality um, not religions but open to a spirituality and open to a sense of naturalness and still find a way to integrate that into what is a, a modern culture and a mm. life. So I, I started to seek out, you know, ways to find to actually live in this world as trying to be me. It was. So that was part of the journey. Um, and then this, my first, I would say, if I would use the word, uh, say, spiritual experience. Okay, or mystical experience. Let's call it a mystical experience. Okay, after the big one of a near-death experience, I, I want to kind of define the difference between the two. It's like I, I have a near-death experience. Now, no magic lights, no flashing lights, but basically the whole of my life turns around 360 degrees on the spot, and I have no idea why or how the, the hell this happened. And I think it took me probably 10 years before I really started to talk about that and really integrate. There was a process of really integrating and understanding what the fucking hell had happened. It was like I'd I'd woke up in a new world. But is it like a thing where, like, you wake up after something and, like, your brain just does not know how to fucking deal with it and you just... Yeah, well, I had... it, it, It kind of goes away somewhere like mm. in, it's yeah. i tell it's more terrifying than that or was it like you saw something and, mm. and i've had it wasn't it wasn't like i saw something like seeing ghosts or seeing spirits or seeing the mystical nothing mm-hmm. like that the near-death experience was nothing like that i woke up in a world that was completely fucking different than it was the day before and I mean, I'm walking around and the town doesn't feel like the town. It feels like a completely new town. The people in my life all felt completely different. My body felt different. The way my eyes worked was different. I literally had to do, I had to learn how to eat again. I had to learn how to Whoa. pick up a cup of tea. Yeah, all I, right. I was really pretty blown to pieces. It was, um, speech was something that was really difficult because I all of a sudden I didn't understand language. 
I could talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could talk. You know, I could go into McDonald's and order a coffee, and I could fill in my tax returns, and I could always ask someone for the right money if they're paying me. But I was left in this way of completely, like, like a newborn child, actually completely looking with wide eyes at this world and wondering what the fucking hell this is. So there became, and I never really understood the experience at that time. I just suddenly thought, I, I have no idea what's happening, but I'm suddenly learning how to be alive in this world. Yeah, and what, never, what, what was the catalyst? What caused the, the experience? I think the, the, it's the cause of the near-death experience was, was medically from just overdosing on alcohol. Okay, my liver shut yeah. down. Okay, and I just collapsed, went into a coma. Yeah. Okay, and you, you just shut down. Okay, so it's just through sheer abuse. That's all, just really, really abusing uh, lifestyle at the time. All right. It really is that. So basically, physically nearly dying, which yeah. is, you know, and I mean, I mean, near death, people often talk about, they say they, you know, talk about they know what death is and this it, talking shit. They are, because no one's ever, ever come back and told us. But I think if you come to the edge of it, All right, and this is the edge, this yeah. void we talk about, right, uh, where we often say there's this creative something that's going on over there, and we're here. You can go to right to the edge of that, and I think when you get to that, the edges, get to the edges in life or the edges creatively, that's where this, I often use great mystery, has an opportunity to get to you. Yeah, I think that's where it can get to you. So, you know, and if it can get to you, uh, I think these. Uh, I always spent most of my life on the run trying to fucking avoid it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I always thought I'd been such a bad bastard that yeah. I had to keep moving all the time. And so that's one way of getting to the edge, you know, nearly kill yourself. That can get you to the edge. You talk to a lot of sports people, they tell you to get into the edge. Yeah. Yeah. But like after that, when did the experience, like when did it start? When did you start feeling different yeah i I, th i would say about a year somewhere between a year and 18 months later yeah from the near-death experience i started to realize something really mystical had taken place all right so like, i would say for the first year i was a bit like <laughs> <laughs> like that yeah well like, what the fuck was that all about yeah okay uh And there is another catalyst point, and that was about 18 months later. Um, this time, I'm in Canada. Yeah. I'm out there in Canada, and I met, met Gilles out there. Really cool old guy, old old native. And uh, and he gave me my first drum. So I, I can remember sitting down with Gilles in his little wooden shack. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we were drinking coffee and talking about some fucking bullshit about something or other you know just guy talk just rapping and and at the time uh you know wise old boy wise old man he, he was old i think he was about 55 60 years old at the time and he gave me my first drum and he just said to me yes steve this is for you and and that's it so i often say to people come sit we're a drum and then You can make up your own goddamn mind. It is. I, yeah. I never tried to say that this is how you should do it or that's how you should do it. And again, that was something that I loved about it. It's it's not a teaching. It's not a dogma. Yeah. It, it's none of these things. It's allowing an experience to take place that is in within a, the mystical. Yeah. I, my, you know, I kind of think when it's outside a language, if I look at some of the religions i'd looked at in the past and there, there's good ones and we could say there's bad ones but this is opinion yeah it's only opinion subjective subjective but i can exactly. i kind of agree mm -hmm. with you yeah there are some good ones actually yeah i mean we can move to i mean i prefer to be i would prefer to be a buddhist or more towards those traditions than say some others yeah but did some of them you're right we or I have experienced, they don't work in my life anymore. Now, that's not to say that they didn't work in the past. Yeah. They don't work for other people. And it's live and let live. But I think rules, when they're written down, 
a static it's solid it says you do it this way and you do this and you do that or you have three children you work for five days a week well let's be really fucking honest our culture and our society is changing so fucking fast that we're outdating the rules faster than we can reinvent the new ones yeah. so the only way i ever found is is like not so much throw the rule book out the window it's let's chuck the language out the window and try and get to the direct experience and then at least everyone and like you can have your experience around a drum i can have mine it's like we might drum i might end up absolutely fucking terrified what i see that day <laughs> yeah. someone else will become ecstatically overjoyed yeah. and have the visions and touch the divine but they're getting the direct experience and then every time it becomes different this is interesting as well so when i started to work with the drum it wasn't the same ecstatic experience every time on a regular basis i could see rhythms and patterns and certain archetypes that start to come through but there was always the touch every time of the newness and the freshness the newness and the freshness that i didn't discover in the dogmas I didn't so and again that, that that was something else that I I found was motivating and I th I found a simplistic honesty within it and it seemed to work in these other ways expansion of awareness within consciousness um, you know it allowed me, allowed me to start to question and question properly about the nature of reality and actually to start to experience it expanding awareness you know dissolving boundaries um, can I found extremely beneficial and it, I, I, I find I was or I was able to find myself put myself properly in a place within within culture yeah I, I was able to find myself that way um, and it was interesting I drummed for probably 15 years on my own oh, yeah you yeah. didn't have a teacher mm. or I was introduced by the John boy uh, Gilles yeah out in Canada okay there was no teacher in the sense of you know this is going to be your shamanic lineage you follow or your traditions that you do no there wasn't but what i did do is i went back and i spent a lot of time in nature and when i say in nature it's just actually getting very quiet yeah in nature i spent a lot of time in canada um, this is one of the reasons i loved lithuania when i first came here the fucking land so giving God, man, you know, it's so beautiful, the land is. And there was a naturalness in the land here that I touched out there. I spent time with the indigenous people. When I say time, actually just being with them. I spent time with you and with some other, other mystical people. Let's yeah. put it like this. Um, but were these like, uh, like modern indigenous people or were or were they yeah. like into the whole you know i think they i often say they lived in two worlds i mean uh say for instance geo man canada <clears throat> very good businessman okay uh chief he was the chief's brother yeah okay he was also kind of their medicine man yeah okay very well integrated into the culture of work and business you know he had three stores that he was running you know i think yeah, about four wives at the time lots of children running around looking after a big family <laughs> kind of like a busy guy yeah and then there was this flip side to him that was completely connected to earth and the naturalness and finding a way to integrate these two together yeah um and i mean of course there was interesting times there you know when you start to learn about the mystical or you're starting to Ex not learn about to experience the mystical when you start to experience it you know strange things start to happen in and around you you do start to experience the, the strangeness of life you can feel it there was times where i felt like the strange person living off up in the mountains you know on mm -hmm. retreat with a big beard yeah with white hair white you beard. got it yeah you you i kind of got why they do this because you're getting a full experience of life just by sitting still and expanding and opening up to it and um uh, 
So I never had a teacher in the sense of, right, okay, you do this for three years, you do that for five years, okay. But I realized I had some very, very loving people that guided me along the way, okay, that just appeared at the right times, you know. They just pop up in your lives, you know. You know, I often called them like angels, you know. Uh, it's like how I was introduced to the drum. Just in the matter of certain conversations, it was just revealed in truth that, okay, this is your path. You will carry this drum. And there is an essence of, to shamanism that I think th that is natural. If I say, uh, I mean, I was always interested in some forms of Nepalese Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, well, like uh, Nepalese shamanism, which is pre, say, if we say Tibetan Buddhism, pre the Buddha. Yeah. All right, if we're going back two and a half thousand years to some of the Bun traditions, I became very interested in that through the naturalness and watching how that had integrated into the Buddhist teachings that we know today. Um, and there is a tradition that you would see there. Or if you talk to Aboriginal people, you know, you've heard of the Aboriginals, they go off and do walkabout. Yeah. And they just disappear. But really what's going on is sh the shamanic path is not so much that you learn a traditional way of doing things so you discover something as an end result. Okay, so if we said, like, if you followed some forms of, you know, modern religions that say you practice this way, uh, you're going to sit in meditation for five hours a day, you're going to sit in the ashram for three years, and then you will get this mystical experience yeah. after you've swept the floor for, you know, five years or whatever, you may well end up with an experience. That's following a path. Now, there's nothing wrong with that because we all start somewhere. But where I found the shamanic path, what tends to be, you go out and you find your own way through the woods. So it, there's a matter of actually discovering exactly what works for you. And it does mean that there was a period of experimentation where I looked into different religions and I looked into different teachings and different practices. You kind of get into an essence of feeling the gut. And then feeling your way forward in this life, allowing yourself to make mistakes, finding the time to allow the mystical to happen. And I think I lived my life more as a quest, in other words, a, a seeking of a something, a wishing to discover a something. And in my experience, what I would say is, if someone follows that, it'll fucking happen. Yeah. You, it does happen. And so I often, people often, I, when I talk about shamanism, I often talk about it being a religion of no religion. You know, that's why there's not too much written down about it. It's like, we're, we're starting to move through things, we're going to something. It's like, I can be scouted, be completely inspired by, you know, Tibetan Buddhism, for yeah. instance. Okay. Have you been there? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I was out there for about three months. Well, in the Indian side, well, the part about this now. Up oh, you were in the, in the in Himalayas? India. Yeah, up yeah. in the Himalayas, yeah. And I kind of think, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. The bullshit is the stuff we have to move through to actually get to it. Now, it's, we feel it's bullshit when we realize it doesn't work or it's not giving us what we want, okay? But I think we have to be honest, it's, we got to start somewhere. And we do start somewhere. So we start moving through things and we, we kind of find that things fall apart in our hands as we're looking at it. Yeah. Things start to collapse. It's like this worked for a week and now it doesn't work anymore. So there is a process when we're seeking of disillusionment and things fall into pieces and, 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 and we do try to grasp onto certain things and they don't fucking work it is everything starts to fall apart and I mean, even science is saying this now when they really look into something there's nothing fucking there yeah they have no idea what's holding anything together you know, none of us have any idea you know how we do this you go, yeah, but I just moved my hand. You go, yeah, but how does that <laughs> But how would you do that? Yeah. <laughs> and okay. And if we say, you are about spirit, 
and things like that, affecting matter. And traditionally, we say that doesn't happen. Well, how can I do that then? Is <laughs> this just a thought that's then becoming an action? So, you know, no. there are many, many challenges yeah, when we start yeah. to look into it. I get you. Um, so, yes, there is the bullshit that we wade through. And then there's the awakenings that come as, as clarity starts to come. And uh, there's, a, there's a sense of naturalness that, that I love to observe come into people's lives. And you know, I loved it when it came into my own, and I, and I love seeing this happen for people, where they just start to become aware of what's going on. And you watch intelligent decisions being made. People start to m take right action. Right, having to think about it. Yeah. You know, they don't have to read in a book, oh my God, I have to do it this way. They just, there's a knowing. The knowingness starts to come through, and that's when the bullshit falls away. And yeah. The naturalness comes in. You know, we become better bastards than we used yeah, to be. Yeah, there's like natural selection <laughs> yeah. of bullshit. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and, but it started with the right intentions. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Every teaching that was ever written down wasn't written down so it could be rotten at the moment. It's like, it's a bit like if you lay down this most amazing drum track and you record it and you get it down and people listen to it the next day and they just go, man, that is fucking bang on. And we know that we were in that moment, and yeah, we yeah, captured you kinda it. Know it's yeah. gonna work. But maybe in two hundred years' time, culture may have changed so much that they don't even understand what that was. Yeah, it's just as things change, or it's know. just not relevant anymore. It's just not relevant. Yeah, exactly. You know, as things change and move, so constant change that's relevant. Um, and yeah, the Himalayas. I did. I spent some time there. That was at me and Joe. Yeah, the, the start of starting the Bardo body of work. Okay, the, this was part of the journey. When I was looking into the, if we say, if I'm looking back in time and I'm looking into different cultures, all right, the one thing that the Himalayas are, they're old. And I'm talking about the mountains. The, mm -hmm. the, those pieces of rock, they're old. They've been around for a long time. Uh, and big old stones and rocks have got a lot of memory. Uh, so I wanted to go up and spend some time there and commune mm -hmm. and just commune with what is natural and I was also interested in the remnants that were left within their art if you look back in some Tibetan art you will see the monsters and the deities that come through you know, you know the you know the five-headed demons that are, will rip your soul out you yeah. will see the reflections of the shadow tides that I could identify with archetypally these kind of archetypes that come through. You mean uh, like culture was in different cultures? It's, in different it's cultures. kind of archetypical. Yeah, you, like, yeah, yeah, yeah there's yeah. a devil, there's a the, something, yeah. You've got, you've got a demon on one yeah, side yeah. called Yamantaka, and then we might call him the devil on another. Um, but I love the way they work with color. They really like working with color, and basic colors are, are basic tones and basic feelings. and. And there was, there always seemed to be an authenticity to, to me in some of their older art. So I wanted to spend some time around that. I wanted to talk to, um, I ended up having a conversation and in a meeting with the state oracle for the Tibetan people. Yeah. Um, he's a um, really interesting character, shaman, altered state of consciousness. And within their government, this is where it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the only governments I know that has a resident shaman who makes the final decision, the final calls, and they will ask spirit and the whole of their culture contained within this spirit for direction and decision. So I wanted to spend some time time with those people, with, with the oracle. Uh, which I was lucky enough to do, and it, m mystically, these things just lined up yeah. and happened, and, and I ended up having a very interesting meeting with him, and and then, then again, the m interesting things happened, I got directed to the Noble Inga School of Art, and was really, really lucky enough to be able to spend some time there and look back into their art and their history, um, which was one of the few cultures that had references to what I call Bardo. Yeah. All right, which is a body of work that I was stepping into, which was, when I say it's a body of work, it's really, a, a, I was starting a spiritual journey. 
okay, that I was going to record as an artist. And I'd gone through a massive mystical experience over a seven-year period, journeying through the essence of what Bardo is, this journey. You mean this... Uh while you were building the gallery or was it like a bit earlier when it started it started three years when the, the gallery i started four years ago yeah uh, and three years par prior to that uh we visited india so i think it was 2010 2011 yeah. and this was the start of this body of work i have no idea at all what was going to open up whether it was it was going to be about bardo gallery I just knew from balls to bones, being in touch in the body, that I had to start this body of work. We both knew, actually, because it, it became very much about artist and muse and, and the relationship that we had at the time. And starting this journey, it led to India. It led to spending time in the Himalaya, but it also led to this whole journey of me trying to bring through the essence of what this is. Um, painter love to paint i've yeah. always worked with my mediums and this i think sometimes people have to learn how to look at a painting i mean we're kind of saturated you know there's lots of you know we're interested there's so many different mediums out there that are being used I and mean, the movies but we have this really fast fucking life yeah everything's on like, you know live in front of our telephones or you know we're in front of screens and everything's going and flashing all the time there is something really really again this is for me it is transcendental or mystical about watching a painting and it really means you do this you stand in front of a painting and look shut the fuck up and look and wait and most people don't know how to do that Later. So the whole idea with Bardo Gallery was creating an environment that just naturally allowed that to happen. Yeah, that's the, I, I've been to quite a lot of like art exhibitions and 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 concerts. Mm -hmm. Like a concert, is you're kind of locked in. You yeah, know? yeah. You, you kind of have to sit through the whole thing. Yeah, don't you? It, it, it's you know, or like. If you're extremely bored or, or whatever, then you just leave. But most people, they sit through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it sounds bad. Yeah, or not. yeah. Somehow they sit through it. But for example, in art galleries, especially in the opening, yeah. like if there's, for example, a famous painter mm -hmm. and he's doing an opening for his exhibition, and like people are going in there, and they're, they're, <laughs> it's it's like it's funny to watch because they're like they're going in there and they're like passing through do you got it yeah they, they just don't stop this they walk real slow like mm -hmm. they're just slowly walking but they're they're still passing through yeah it doesn't matter the the thing can be like two meters on three meters big they're just gonna look at it pass through yeah I think that that's probably yeah. why I think a lot of artists were inspired to turn the volume up on things to try and catch your attention. It's like to stop you, to make you watch, to yeah. make you observe. Yeah. And I like that observation. You're right. You're almost locked into a gig, so you do have yeah. to stay with it. And I'm, I'm, I, I remember yeah. the first time I was in Bordeaux, and uh, me and, and Paulus from Johan mm -hmm. we we came to see to see the Bordeaux. Because we, we have heard like a lot of rumors that, oh my God, this is amazing and you have to see it. And so we went there and you were somewhere else. Probably, you joined yeah, us yeah. You joined us later, mm -hmm. but uh, Yolanta uh, met us at the gate, I yeah. think, or at the door. And uh, I remember entering the Bardot and there was this moment like when I entered and it's cold. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, you know, the first thing that locked me in was the the sheer, you know, frost. Not yeah. frost, but just, like, the, the feeling coldness. of coldness. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. We all, like we say, we all have our own... I mean, I love the feedback that comes, because everyone, say, who goes through Barlow Gallery, because they come out with a, a different experience. Yeah. Thankfully, most of the visit have an experience. And that, I think, going... <laughs> 
I, lo- I there, it was this whole thing. I don't consider Bardo Gallery like a gallery and paintings. I just consider it. It's like almost. It's just one experience. It's just this experience of art. If we're going to give it a title, but you you get an experience that, that's beyond, you know, the normal way of experiencing art. You're allowed. My whole thing was, I want to be able to allow people to experience it, to be able to experience art, because I think it's, you know, the, it is one of the few mediums that are left in, in our world that, that can convey something of that is of the mystical, the transcendental. Um, you know, I think it can convey an awful lot of honesty as well. Uh, you know, you know, I, I, I think art, artists probably tell, and again, I think this is paraphrasing, I can't remember who originally said this, but I think, you know, artists tell lies to reveal the truth. Mm-hmm. It was maybe politicians tell lies to cover up the truth. Yeah. You know? and, and then again, that, that, that was the whole inspiration with Bardo, was trying to be able to find the best possible way to deliver this if i can yeah yeah to deliver it yeah which is people often come into bardo gallery and first thing that they do they do it with joe a lot they yeah. do is they said sort of, tell me all about this what's <laughs> going on in his mind blah blah explain blah. this please. explain this and it's and joe's got very good the same as that. it's like no go in and have an experience make up your own goddamn mind Make up your own God on mind and see what it reflects back to yourself. It is. And I watch people, they come out the other end different. That's nice because they've had an opportunity to think. They've had an opportunity to step out of whatever is the norm in their lives. And then they've had yeah. an opportunity to touch it. It's the same if you, if you go to a concert. I like say you 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 working yourself and you're doing a gig. Those times when it's on and it's right, people come out different than they go in, and that, that's what motivates us. Yeah, it, it really does. Yeah, make them think. Make them think. It is. Make them think about something they don't understand. You know, it puts people in touch with desire, with the things that we say are unimportant. It puts them in touch with their body, in touch with their feelings. You know, even like, but like, even if. If we're, we can be talking about things we don't understand, mm. but that's another cool thing. Yeah. We're still, you know, we're showing them that we're thinking. Yeah, that's a this, is, this is very true. Yeah, because there's very few things I understand, but there's some that I have experienced from balls to bones. I you know in a mystical experience or yeah. a creative yeah. process that are 100% real, but I can't fucking give it to you like an object it's like if i say say it like this and this is a way i like to try and explain it it's like the mystical experience is very much or an experience around art of touching something is very much like being in love now that's something that most of us know we've always experienced falling in love now we can't you know, I, I love Joe, okay? I know that from balls to bones. It's an experience, yeah. all right? But if someone says to me, prove it, <laughs> I, I can. How? How? How can I prove it? The only way I, I ever saw that I could possibly prove it was, say, through art, through poetry, through some kind of expression that just bears witness to the fact yeah. that there's something that's going on that I can't show you Uh, and I think art the experiences around art and the experiences around mysticism are very much like that I think they're devalued but then our natural instincts to be drawn as human beings towards the arts to be fascinated like this really does tell us something about that you know the maybe these unseen things you know these values of love of integrity about intelligence you know about the mysticism the understanding that we don't know fucking everything yeah, right? yeah. i think they're really very very important to us and it's through the arts that we find them because yeah. we don't find them you know through our day jobs or things like that and uh 
Uh, to, to me, that, that, that it became the thing that drove me and motivates me in my life. It, it really is. It is that fact of trying to convey that. It is. Um, that, if I could backtrack right back in my life, you know, I could live a life where, you know, I get up at fucking seven o'clock in the morning and I go to work on a construction site, which I've done just to earn some money to be able to put some food in my belly and pay the rent and living in abject fucking poverty, literally, you know, living that type of life. The light at the end of the tunnel for that, or the the way out of that, was touching the mystical, touching that magic. Yeah. You know? and, I, and I use the word magic. That's an interesting word to use. And that means events that happen that we cannot explain, really. And if we just take the medium, falling in love. <clears throat> when two people meet and love happens... That's most people's experience of the mystical because they really do watch things shift and change in their lives. You know, then you know they, they watch how people are attracted over great distances and things line up like this yeah. so amazingly, and I it creates something new. And there is, there's, I often say it's like a magical child is born. Okay, a lot of love leads to children. That's how we got here. God yeah. bless you, mother, or whatever <laughs> you know. Um, but it does. That leads to something else that's yeah. born out of it. Now, that's not a tangible thing. You know, it's not like a table or a teacup or an item, you know, a house or a bag of money. It's not yeah. those things, but it has this most immense power. It has this most immense power. And, you know, I, I, I think that is worth honoring in our lives and worth touching. Yeah. Uh, is that mystical? Mm. Cool. It? Yeah. <laughs> Touch the mystical. Touch the mystical. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Touch that's the really mystical. where it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All Let's right. wrap this up. I think so. Yeah. yeah. All right. It's cool. Getting here. Time to put some food in my bag. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, man. That was awesome. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks. Yeah. Well, it was a good little wrap, wasn't it? Yeah.